and they were rampaging along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out firing tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or in the bottom with six points and seven for bottom with throw. Yes and no. Yes and no. Paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, one six one. Depends what the teams are bumping with, not it? Welcome to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. Today we are talking to Jordan Keane and Taylor Bruce. It's going to be a great show with lots of good guests joining us today. First though, Alex, we're going to have a chat and what have you got for us? Yes, yes, we are going to have a chat, Erin, and I've got a few things that I wanted to sort of talk about before we get stuck into the guests that we, we have coming on the show. Good, because you don't want me to ask you what have you got for us today, Alex, and you go, nothing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a short, that'd be a short, uh, that'd be a short segment, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, and moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> so now I thought um, we'll start. I'll start at the beginning of my list of things. So, um, Will Bowles has come out with a new law book, Erin. We've mm-hmm. got a new law book okay. out, Crystal something something. Crystal Mark Edition four, I think Mark four. So okay. they go through that process every couple of three years. Uh, might be oh, couple of three years. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yep. I've just been reading what it says. Anyway, I went through the new law book and had a nosy at the the key changes they've made, of which there is a number. You can find them if anyone's listening on the World Bowls website. So if you just Google World Bowls law book, uh, that pretty much does it. And they've got a good document there that's got every law that they have either added or changed. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'd just pick out some that I found interesting to me. Yeah. And if I'm lucky, it might be interesting to one other person. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is um, Law 5.1.1 now says uh, that an, it's an inclusion of trial ends when moving interrupted game between a vegetation green and a synthetic rindle green. So okay. that's a really good um, change. It happens sometimes anyway, but it just clarifies, you know, if I'm playing a championship or something out on uh, a grass green mm-hmm. and it persists down and mm-hmm. I get moved somewhere else, you're allowed a trial end before you play. Oh, that's but good. It's yeah. just a bit of common sense, yeah. isn't it? You know? A little bit, yep. So that's here now. Um, The other one is uh, Law 13.3. It's a new law now to state that a player must not deliver a bowl before the previous bowl has come to rest. So that's a law now. Yes. I always thought that was a law. I think it's implied. Okay. I think it's implied because... Just you, good manners. Yeah, yeah, and you have you have ownership of the rank until your bowl has stopped. Yeah. Um, but it just isn't, it's a, just a new law, so it makes that absolutely clear if you've played a bowl, Aaron, and even if it's missing the entire head, I can't get on the mat and play my bowl. Presumptuous that I'm <laughs> missing the entire... Okay, anyway. Yeah, true, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't play my bowl until your one has uh, come, come to, to rest spot. there. Um, the other one, which is really uh, good, is Rule 26.3, or Law 26.3 now. It clarifies that there must be no further play in a knockout competition if it's impossible to win the game, given the number of ends left. So mathematically impossible, you cannot keep on playing Correct. for the sake of playing. Yeah, yep. the game just stops. The game will stop. And that's, I think that's a good... I think that's a logical step because mm. knockout play is usually a time-sensitive situation when you've got post-section games happening yeah. um so if that happens from now on and i uh, you know you can't you literally can't win the game you just shake hands yeah. and move on as the uh as and the what law. what about the times where it's there's no time limit to a game you'd still you'd still move on you'd move so on. well not, i guess it's, it's gonna not necessarily about the time limits to the game but it's how long that post section takes yeah because i guess you could find a time in a competition where there will be a team that even though they're mathematically not going to win they want to Some people want to keep playing. and finish. Yeah, yeah. and there's yeah. a time and place for that, but it's, not, yeah. an, it's mm-hmm. not a knockout, not in post-section. And I think when you look at, I mean, fingers crossed we get a really beautiful summer this year. Uh, we get out on the greens this year. We don't get locked down for any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Touch wood. Um, <laughs> and yeah, when you think about how long you're out there for the days that you're out there, if you're not constantly out in an environment that's hot, it just is also better on bowlers' health and everything like that as well. It yeah. just keeps them a little bit out of the sun. Yeah, I think it's just a sound It's a sound law to have. Mm-hmm. So 26.3, you, you know, you yep. just uh, don't keep going if you can't win. Nice. Um, and then law 37.1.3. It's a long book, I wouldn't be reading it. <laughs> um, uh, now states, if a bowl on its original course is deliberately displaced or stopped by a member of the team that delivered the bowl, yep. the defaulting team will forfeit the game to their opponent. So they would be the defaulting team. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I've just read it properly. Um, so if you have played a bowl, and I'm your skip here. We're playing mixed pairs here. We're playing mixed yep. pairs together, yep. and you're my lead, and yep. it's heading in a bad place, and I go, no, and I stop the bowl, we lose that game. Yes. Us, you yes. and me lose the game. Yes, because you've interfered with it. Yeah. Okay. That's a bit frightening. Yeah. But fair enough, you know, you can't be doing that. Um. Why would you get involved in my bowl rolling up the green? Because I'm your skip. Yeah. And I want you to play a good bowl. Yeah. So say we're holding a number. Yeah. Maybe you've drawn two touches. Yeah. And I want you to miss the entire head. Yeah. And you just let it go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be really tempting, I suppose, you know, if I was wanted to cheat and to stop the bowl yeah. so that it didn't destroy the head. I don't think that penalty existed before. Okay. Maybe it would have been that we just lose the bowl or there's some sort of, sort of smaller penalty. So you could interfere with it previously. Yes, and I'm not sure if it was covered. I have to read the rules, yeah. but it's a, it says it's a new law. Okay. Um, so, so you could have put your foot out, and it could have hit your foot, and then it becomes a non-bowl. Yeah. So as yeah. opposed to me going to mess up the head yeah. a little bit so because I've I've delivered a really poor one. What they've done is clarified that law. So these are the world bowls. Yes. Rules and regulations. Yep. And all countries have their own a set of domestic regulations. Domestic regulations sit underneath that, yeah. Domestic regulations that sit under that. Yeah. So obviously, we've just taken these from the World Bowls website. Yeah. And do we know if our umpires have had a look at them yet? Yes, our umpires would have been involved um, throughout the process as yeah. well because member nations put forward suggestions to change the law. Excellent. Um, yeah. So we'll give you an update when when uh, we will eventually have those law books available for purchase. Maybe what we could do. Just having a thought here, is we could open it up and people could have a couple of weeks to read over the new changes and then maybe let's get an umpire on the show. I think we should definitely and do that. And then we could take questions. We will do that. Because we've had a couple of umpires on the shows previously, but this time it's going to be, it sounds like there's quite a number of laws that have been changed. Okay. And just to help everyone all end up on the same page yep. before the season starts. So if you're listening to this podcast, you will have seen in the link uh, that you will have clicked on that we will have asked, <laughs> asked, asked, <laughs> asked, a, um, question. asked a question about, uh, you know, we'll give you a link to the new law book and the changes that have been made. Have a nosy through. If you've got any questions, send them to us at info@bowlsnewzealand.co.nz or comment on our Facebook page and we'll get Michael Johnson or one of his cohorts along in a couple of weeks' time to answer every and all questions you've got because I'm not sure if Erin and I would do that good a job. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at talking, but maybe not the laws. Oh, excellent. And moving on now. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. That's very, very technical. It is very Let's technical. Let's have something a little bit lighter. Right, so on the last weekend, which is a few days ago now, um, I was lucky enough to be in the indoor North Island team, Erin, and I just wanted yes. to, to talk about that mainly because we didn't lose to the South. Well done, well done. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. Um, so, no, it's a cool little event. Um, How many years has it been since you've not lost to the South? It was our 19th year in a row <laughs> that we have won that North vs South Test match. The last time we lost was 2003, and it's been going since the late 70s. That, that's, that well, event, that's a so. long time. We were, uh, we were pretty pleased. It was mm -hmm. hard. I mean, every year it's extremely challenging. There are, The way the indoor one works is they pick a singles, a pairs, and a triples, and a fours team for the men and the women. Mm -hmm. So there's 10 players per team, um, and or 20 players per team, sorry, 10 men and 10 women. Yep. You take on the South in three games at 21 ends on your discipline and the team that's won the most games at the end of the day wins the event. Uh, so it was satisfying to be part of that. But the reason I wanted to bring it up was putting my North Islander hat on. <laughs> we have a an upcoming outdoor North versus South match in September. Ironically being held indoors in the hopes yeah. to need a little bowl yeah. stadium. <laughs> it's indoors but not in that way. But uh, it's not carpet bowls. Kind of Mat bowls. What else can I say to upset you about it? <laughs> yeah, you're going okay, Erin. It's, uh, yes, it's been held on the 10th or the 9th and 10th and 11th or something. 9th is the Friday, so the... Tenth. Action for the North versus South starts on the 10th at midday. 10th and 11th of yep. September, which I'm excited about. And I, d I don't want to put any pressure on the North Islanders. Um, but Just I was, saying, you know, North. The, the indoor North team hasn't lost a game and a test match in a while and I would like to think that it's a good sign. Yeah, yeah there I'd, we go. There I'd we like go. to think that that's going to be boding well for the North Island team as well. I, all I wanted to say there. And the other thing I wanted to talk about before we say who's coming up next, Erin, is that we've had a few queries and I've addressed it I think the last couple of bowls hours about when the Nationals entries will be opened. I have a date now yes. uh, for everyone. The 19th of September yep. we will open up entries for every National event. So that's the... Singles, pairs... Fours, mixed pairs. Yes. Para. 
Yes. Yes. Yep. All yep. open. It'll be all open, open up on the, all at once on the nineteenth of September, and we'll make sure that our website is ready to take that, and it'll be entries. How well. is it? Bowls Hub. Bowls Hub. Yep. Bowls Hub. Hub Aotearoa. Yep, yep. Same yep. as we did uh, uh, last year. It'll be a the Bowls Hub system, which we're excited about, and has been sort of devel- developing quite nicely. So, if you signed up last year, all you need to do is just log in and click on it this year. Yes, it'll be pre- it's pretty simple, and we'll um, we'll include instructions like we d- did last season as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing those entries roll in. They and you might have to do a password reset for me because I don't think I can remember oh, mine. I can never <laughs> my password. Don't worry, we can help with that. There's no worries. Um, so yeah, the uh, the nationals, the fours, the mixed pairs, obviously Central Otago this year. Yes, and the single and Piers, North Harbour and Auckland will be hosting those. Wonderful. More, I think more North Harbour clubs than Auckland clubs, yep. but it's such a big event you have to uh, breathe over. So I think, yeah, that's all I had to talk about for the first segment, Erin. And now we're going to be speaking next with Jordan Keane here on the Bowls Hour. Welcome back to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. Now on the show, Erin, we have Jordan Keane calling in from somewhere in the Wellington region. How are you, Jordan? I'm good, Alex. Thanks for having me on the show. No, no worries. It's always uh, I'm always reticent to ask that question because I wonder what would happen if I said, how are you feeling? And so I went, oh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that great, eh? It's not been a great day. <laughs> but that's okay. That's all good. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, we asked you on because you're still, you're still, well, extremely young in comparison to a lot of bowlers and you've done a lot in uh, bowls indoor and outdoors. So I thought um, we'd just talk a bit about that. But, like, the first question I usually ask people, I'll ask it to you as well, is what's, What's your first memory of bowls? Um, first memory is probably um, back in oh, since I was about three or four. I've been you know going along to bowls, mum and dad, and down in Otago and stuff. So I was in fact, I was probably there since the day I was born. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I'd occasionally you know, grab one, try chuck it up the mat. Probably not even get halfway up. But um, I first started playing when I was about seven. Um, up in club once we moved up to Wellington. Okay. Um, yeah, they just invited me along, said, do you want to have a go? And I was like, I won't do any good, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, too. I can empathise with that. Um, <clears throat> so, like, when, when, if you think back to when you were a, a kid and being, you know, we get taken along to these bowling halls and whatnot, did you ever look at it then and think, oh, yeah, I'll take this seriously? Or was it always just something that you sort of had to come along to? Oh, I, I was always there and I was always... <laughs> It always looked a bit intimidating, usually because I was usually along for rep matches and stuff, and I'd watch and I'd go, oh, I don't know if I could take this seriously, I don't know if this is, you know, if I'd really fit in, but it's sort of, you know, once you get introduced to that, that club aspect, where things are a lot more relaxed, um, you know, you, you work your way in, and, and I sort of found, um, I just got comfortable, met some good people, and yeah, just sort of got with it, I was, I was going well, wanna, I think I won my... A club four was my first year with mum, so I was pretty... At the age of seven. Chuffed. I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> no, no. Um, no, I thought it was pretty good, and I was like, well, I want to keep winning, so let's, <laughs> let's keep with it. Yeah, fair, fair enough, too. Um, so, you know, that's sort of your indoor journey. You started that when you were young and part of the, um, at the moment, it's the Hutt Valley Centre, isn't it, before I offend anyone with the... I, will, yeah, I, I yeah, hate to Hutt get Valley. the wrong bit of Wellington. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Hutt Valley Centre, and I've, I've done well there, and we'll cover that um, uh, soon. But the outdoor bowls uh, side of things, what's your first recollection of, of that one? Um, well, I started playing for school probably you know, four or five years ago in year nine, um, Bronzeville College, just doing the college stuff. And I was doing really well. I picked it up. I took uh, Dad's bowls, um, started using those, and... I was. I already obviously had the you know the concept from indoor and you know some technique from him. So I was I was already you know that sort of that step ahead of most college kids starting out. Um, but then last season, um, and uh, so I joined up at Stokes Valley. Um, we had a mate there, and he recommended it because I wasn't you know too familiar with the outdoor scene, you know the people and stuff. Um, but yeah, they're really good over there. They've they've helped me out first. First season it was really good. Won the <laughs> yet again first year won the won the, won the club fours. I mean a habit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, no, that just that's gone really well for my first season. Um, yeah, you know, they've they've been really good to me. Yeah, how do you find the outdoor game having come from the indoor game? Like how how different do you find it? 
it's it's all just down to to a different technique. I find you know I, I still you know I think over time it'll I'll read things differently, but I still look at an outdoor head as as an indoor head. And, you know, um, obviously it's you know heads can be a bit looser and stuff, but um, yeah, it's just you know there's a there's a lot more social dynamic I think in the outdoor. Um, you know, you're always you, know, you stick around afterwards. You have a drink and whatnot, and it's um, it's just a real good environment, especially like you know younger people like me. They you know they look at you know the the majority of players tend to be on the older side, mm. but you know there's actually a lot of you know a lot of the top bowlers are, are young and have decades ahead of them. Um, so yeah, it's just yeah, it's it's a really good environment to be in. And, and I enjoy it a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. And do you think having come from a, an indoor background, you found it giving you sort of a, a leg up or a sort of, um, like I often think, like I started outdoor as well after playing indoor for a long time. And we have this, yep. the, the junior system in outdoors. I never really felt... I don't really feel like a junior, if that makes sense. <laughs> like, I yeah. I'm amongst these people, first or second year bowlers. And it's like, well, I've actually been playing bowls since I was... You know, knee high to a grasshopper. How did you find that when you when you sort of came out? Do you think it, it helped you out? Yeah, it, it did. Um, like I've been I've been playing a lot with Jason Puck at Stokes Valley. He's been he's been helping out juniors and stuff. And he would, um, you know, he you know occasionally he you know look to me um, just on you know just in a general you know getting the junior involved and stuff. But also he knows I've got that bit of insight. Um, you know, what am I doing and that sort of thing. So, you know, it did help. And, um, you know, recently when the under 18 Wellington team went up to Hastings, um, oh, another call comes through. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> started Hastings. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we went up to Hastings and I was, I'm probably the oldest in the team. I was, I was relegated captain, I think, on the second day. <laughs> um, but you know, I, said, I just felt that that step ahead. I was like, these guys are all new to the game, but I still feel like I've got, you know, that that more experience um, just with the indoor. Because um, it's the same thing; it's just bigger. Yeah, you know, it's, it's bigger bowls, bigger bigger green for sure and, p- and picking up on that um, uh, your Wellington team going to the whatever it was you said you were going to we were talking to Brady Amer a couple of weeks ago works for Bowles Wellington um, and he was talking about yep. that team did you have some success there Jordan and if you did can you just remind me what it was yeah um, so the under 18 Wellington team um, was selected and there was I think it's about nine of us so we went up to Hastings um, there was two a tournament uh, between us, Waikato, uh, Hawks Bay, and Wairapa, I believe. Um, and we had no expectations going in because we still had a few um, newbies in the team. Like they've been playing for a couple of years, but a lot, like a lot of them, didn't have you know club experience and yeah. stuff, just college balls. But um, it just we were just flowing. Everyone was playing out of the tree and. I think at the end we were ahead by about three games, six points, something like that. Oh, sweet. Um, so we took away that trophy, uh, well, which was which was really good. Yeah, so as a captain, how did that feel for, for you to, to be captaining this team of people with no expectations who sort of zipped through and, and won this event? Oh, it, it was really good. We were, you know, I, we hadn't established actually a captaincy on the first day, but I was, I'd sort of just sort of stepped into being that supportive um, guy with the more experience and just, you know, being... Um, on the sidelines, just you know, cheering them on, um, and giving advice where I can and that sort of thing. Um, and it, yeah, it was really good. Like the team, you know, initially, you know, once we got to know each other after the first day, um, and there was a bit of social interaction. We all went out for dinner and that sort of thing. It was really we started to gel and just worked together really well. Right. Um, yeah, it was really good. Oh, that's cool. That's good. I like hearing those um, sort of success stories. So, uh, you know, on that word success, um, uh, and we think about successes, if you look back on your indoor, I suppose you've had a longer indoor career than an outdoor one um, at the moment, uh, but what are some yeah. successes that sort of stick out for you when you think, yeah, that's uh, that's something I can look back on and be be pretty proud of? Um, oh, 
don't tell my first big, <laughs> <laughs> my, my first my first big one was probably the the New Zealand secondary schools singles. Um, that was twenty nineteen. So I was, I was a year ten, and um, I'd sort of been coming through, and that was just I was just going really well that day. I think I, I think I had a draw in in qualifying, but just I was breezing through. Had a pretty stressful final. Traded a three and a four back and forth and that sort of stuff, but that was really good. Um, I just got the the North Island um, secondary school singles as well, and the, the bronze and the peers with my mate Logan from school. Um, yes, and then there's there's you know Welsh. Um, I haven't got the big one yet, but Patterson with Hart Valley's really stepped up in the last so sort of three years. Yeah, um, so just, um, and we're on a good run of yeah. success. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just quickly. So, okay. um, an indoor for those listening uh, who might not uh, know, our indoor centre is sort of a bit like it used to be in the old days with the outdoor wear. It's divvied up into six, well, it used to be divvied up in six zones for the moment, isn't it? Well, what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, one to six. <laughs> so, you win your zone, you go through to our national uh, final, which is called the Welsh Trophy, named after George Welsh, who did a lot for bowls. Um, and the Wellington region, mm-hmm. unlike an outdoor, you're divvied up into a number of centres so you've got um, Hutt Valley, Upper Hutt and North Wellington and then also in your zone is Horifanua yeah. and Wairapa and Bushrohini that's the ones, so it's a really tough um, zone and Hutt Valley you know, can you just talk us through, you say you in the last few years you've had a lot of success um, in a really hard fought zone which is true and sort of something that you know, it's not like Hutt Valley came back but you sort of, if you were to look over the last 10 or 15 years perhaps you guys didn't perform as well as you might have a while ago. Is there anything you think that's yeah. that's made you guys so successful in the last three or four years at that Patterson zone level? Um, I think there was a bit of a change in dynamic for us. We had um, Paul Rubinsky come in and he's been just sort of coaching and you know really trying to just raise that level of competitiveness in our team. He he really. I was after that. I think yeah, twenty nineteen. I really was pushing to earn my spot, and he. He sort of vouched for me and said, put him in, give him a chance. And I had a really good first day, but he was just really good with helping us on our mental side. Um, you know, how we just get that step by step and how we work through the day, keeping our focus and that sort of thing, just bringing that edge back in and just, you know, making us that more competitive side where we were, you know, actually leading throughout the day instead of having to fight our way the entire time. Um, so yeah, like he's been really good, and the team's just been like we've all gotten closer and just worked really well together. Um, so it's been really good, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Oh, I think that's um, you can see that in a lot of teams. Uh, you're successful if you sort of understand how each other sort of tick, um, so to speak. Um, so yeah. go- goals, Jordan. What what are your goals going forward for the indoor and the outdoor sport, and say the next? <laughs> We'll go next three to five years. We won't go. <laughs> You've got a lot of time <laughs> in your career. So, what are your sort of short to medium term <laughs> term goals? What would you like to tick off the list? Oh, there's. Uh, I think. Well, at the end of the month, literally in about two weeks, is the New Zealand Junior Singles, and that'll be my ninth <laughs> attempt. <laughs> I, I, I like to say I've probably got the best and worst record. I've been there for probably one of the longest competing, yet still haven't won it. So that's that's the big one for me. Trying to get that one at the end of the month, um, and then there's the Welsh. How Valley's got? We've got a couple of shots at it um, with the postponed event from 2021 um, in September. Um, so that's just that's a free shot at us for you know just trying to show our best and get the big one. And then next year there's the the division um, coming through. How that how that works? I'm still not quite sure, but. Um, yeah, we don't have time on this podcast. To, to, yeah, to, yeah no, that's a whole, that's a whole another conversation. We'll just say that it's a big event. <laughs> yep, big event. event. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, and then I want to. I guess next five years, I want to try sort of improve on my nationals results. I've never, you know, been sort of on that. Uh, some on that topper end of the, of the junior spectrum nowadays, but haven't quite had the the success at nationals. Just been, you know, pit, like. I think Kerry Anderson, who was on last week, she put me in post section of the singles um, at nationals this year. So just try and improve on that sort of stuff. Um, bring myself in, and myself into the uh, the North Island team. I was reserved this year, and 
Um, they're supporting you guys. Yeah, you, you had a pretty good uh, yes, yeah, yeah, outing yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just about um, covered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so earning my way in there would be would be nice to do. But um, yeah, just just improving, just getting better, get up to that top level. Mm, for what sure. I want to do. Yeah, and the, the last thing I was going to ask you uh, before we get on to the bonus question, Jordan, is you know, and some people don't have an answer for this question. That's fair enough. But if you were to think about idols or maybe people that you uh, try to model your game off or look at and think, you know, that's something that I can take an aspect of what they do in Vols. Um, are there any that come to mind to you that sort of fill that? Um, a lot of it's in the family, eh? Like my dad, who um, someone who passed away last year, Alistair Keith, um, he was great outdoor bowler down in Otago. Uh-huh. And my aunt, Sandra, um, She's a, she's a handy bowler from what I know. She's, um, yeah, she's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're just trying to follow their success. They've been really good and, um, you know, they, they're just, yeah, they're so good to watch. Mum and dad, their you know, mum's on the cusp of, she was, well, she was served in New Zealand, so trying to sort of follow that and <laughs> maybe beat her to it. Mm. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. That's fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and oh, people, people in Hutt Valley as well. Um, you know, the likes of Marcus and Joseph and stuff. You know, watching them has really helped me improve. Um, just on how they read ahead, how they hold themselves, that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, those kinds of guys, they've been really good. Yeah, fair enough. And just real quickly, talking about um, Shelley. So at the Indoor Nationals this year, uh, she skipped and won. Second woman ever uh, to skip and win an Open National Fours uh, title. And... You yep. know, I'm the son of a quite a good uh, indoor bowler, and I remember watching her mm. in big events, and I found it infinitely more stressful than playing. And I was wondering, <laughs> you know, how how did you feel watching her go through post section? What were the emotions going through um, <sighs> that day? Oh, it was, we were actually looking at it like you know, she had. We actually their team was so not put together, but it was the remnants of trying to put together some Patterson teams and try those out. And those didn't actually go too well. Like um, <laughs> myself and Marcus and dad and stuff, we we dipped out in the first round or something in the fours. Um, and mum, she was just like, she had Marie and stuff and they were just going really well. They had a couple of good wins and all of a sudden they're, they're right there and they're, you know, they're playing Ashley Diamond in the semifinal and you're like, I'm sitting here, I'm like, this it would just be awesome to see her get at least to that final because mm. then we were going to have that all Hutt Valley final, yeah. you know, in two of the events because um, we had it in the singles as well. And I was watching, watching her semi against against um, Ashley was, man, that was stressful because <laughs> right down to the last bowl, holy hell. Yep, I remember um, I watched that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in that final, I was just like, we were all there and, in all honesty, obviously I wanted mum to win, but there was, you know, it was all Hutt Valley, so I was, you know, we were going to be happy either way, and they were they were rooting for each other. Yeah. Um, so, no, it was stressful, but great to see. Oh, that's good. Thank you for that insight. I was, yeah, it, was just, it occurred to me, I remember on the day thinking, yeah, I remember, I've, yeah, I've watched my mum play a few things, and <laughs> I find it yeah, infinitely more stressful than actually playing balls. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Okay, oh, thank you very much for coming on to the, um, onto the show, Jordan. I've got one more question before we go, and it's uh, on this bowls hour thing we sort of um we ask a rant we call it the bonus question usually it appears to be food related as the thing that's come through we started off just asking random ones but it's gone to food so the bonus question for yep. you today is you know what is your ideal sandwich what's in your ideal sandwich if you if you had to pick one well, people are going to hate this um <laughs> uh, i'm probably yeah, i'm probably the hater i'm um, not the hater i'm probably the plainest eater um, on planet Earth, so I would I would take a few pieces of ham, butter it up, stick it together. That's a sandwich for me. Okay. Maybe chuck some lettuce in if I want it. <laughs> but are we, are we talking shaved ham or ham off the bone ham? What's a uh, shaved ham? Shaved <laughs> so, ham. Okay. Shaved ham. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was on board. I was on board when I thought it was from ham off the bone. That's fine. <laughs> everyone's nah, everyone's nah. entitled to their own opinion, eh? That's, uh, that's <sighs> no worries. Yeah. Um, um, 
All good. Well, thank you very much anyway, uh, Jordan, and I'd like to wish you uh, all the best for the rest of your indoor season, although not too much luck at the Welsh Trophy because I'm also playing in that <laughs> and I don't come from Hutt Valley. But yeah, all the best for the rest of your indoor season and for your outdoor and indoor career as well, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thanks for talking to us, Jordan. Finally, lucky last, we've got Taylor Bruce, who's had a very, very busy time of it recently, and she'll be telling us all of the happenings that she got up to at a little competition we call Birmingham 2020 here on the Bowls Out. Welcome back to the Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel. And now, Erin, we have Taylor Bruce back, uh, back from the other side of the world and on the line. Uh, how are you, Taylor? I'm doing all right, thanks. Um, currently isolating at home with COVID, but... <laughs> Um, I have seen the worst of it, so I'm feeling on the up, and it's nice to let the success of being away kind of sink in. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll call that the silver lining. You get a, a chance to reflect. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've recently been on the other side of the world competing in the Commonwealth Games, which we'll get to soon, um, and you did very well, by the way, which we'll also cover soon. But I thought before we get to that uh, you know, wonderful success, I'd just like to take us right back to the beginning and just mm-hmm. ask, you know, what was your first experience or taste of, of bowls? Right. So my dad played at Burnside Bowling Club before I started, and we used to watch a little bit um, on a Saturday afternoon, but it never really captured my interest Mm. we really only went down for a bag of chips and and a can of coke (laughs) so um i didn't really pay much attention to the game itself until he took me along to the world bowls in 2008 where burnside was the host of that so the minute i saw the the club in a different light and there were young people playing and it was a competitive atmosphere i was really taken by the sport and excited by the whole environment and that grasped my interest really and from then on I, I wanted to give it a go and um, first had a roll up at my grandparents club um, after the World Bowls and it was a very pineapple looking bowl that went halfway down the green so <laughs> it ended up being a lot harder than I, I thought it you know looked from the stands um, but I kept trying and Vince Roper who's still my coach he, he was a member of Burnside and quickly worked with me at the start of my membership at Burnside and really taught me the fundamentals of the game and, and how to deliver the bowl in a more consistent way. So that really set me up for quite early success, I guess you mm-hmm. could say. So back in those days, like you just started, and obviously your grandparents and um, dad played a bit of bowls. When you mm-hmm. started, did you think then, oh, you know, 10 years' time, I'll be playing for New Zealand, or was it more just an immediate, I'd like to have a bowl up a green and see what happens sort of thing? Well, I think because the atmosphere that grasped me towards the game was a high-performance mm. environment, I think right from the start, that's what I wanted to be. Mm. Uh, that, that that inspired me straight away. I wanted to play at a World Bowl, you know? Um, and so I guess I always dreamed that I would eventually make it to that stage of the sport right from when I walked through the gate and I guess you never really know if it's going to happen or not but I've always been passionate about wanting to represent in some way I used to play netball um, at school and I guess I always had that dream of having my my surname on the back of my shirt whatever that looks like so there was a part of me that always wanted to succeed in sport but I didn't expect that bowls would be my my way through and so it was exciting when I started to really fall in love with the sport and, and find that I, I could get better with it uh, through practice and training and, and learning the hard way. Mm, for sure. So if we talk about early successes then, so you start playing in 2009-ish after the World mm-hmm. Bowls. Um, how long did it take for you to find a bit of success in, in the game? Like When did that first happen for you? I, well... <laughs> There were some good pathways for juniors and for youth when I started, which was quite fortunate. So it was actually quite early on where I started to succeed in, you know, like first and second year singles, uh, junior singles. We had a few youth events like secondary school bowls and uh, Kitty Hawk under 21 competitions. So 
I was starting to succeed against competition at a similar level to me. Mm. So obviously I wasn't up to beating seniors when I first started because I was still new and, and learning the game. But I was starting to get a bit of success with my peers and other other juniors at the same level as me. So that was a nice colour that I was tracking where I was hoping to be mm. and um, really inspired me to keep keep going and trying to reach my potential. And so I was included in like a talent development squad that was run through Bowls New Zealand that taught me some really great high performance skills. Uh, I was included in um, the New Zealand under 18 team, which exposed me to international play and high performance and, and even competing against Australians at a similar age is another way to figure out sort of where you're at. Um, so I think I was really fortunate of when I came into the game that there were some really great pathways and I was challenged and pushed out of my comfort zone from the start. Mm. And so that helped me to reach my potential quite quickly, I think. For sure. And I think there was a there was a really cool photo when we had the Trans-Tasman uh, and there was a group of you who had come through you know, we talk about the age group and the development and stuff who came all the way through and are now senior representatives um, for New Zealand. When you sort of mm-hmm. look around at the international events that you participate in now, um, do you see that from outside of New Zealand as well? Are there those generations that have, have, have come through um, playing with and against? A hundred percent. It's actually quite surreal playing at this last Commonwealth Games and looking around and seeing all these players that we've played in World Youth championships over the years yeah. and trans Tasmans over the years. You look at Ellen Ryan, for example. I mean, she she was in the under-18 team when we played in Howick in Auckland in 2013. You could say I anything think, and I'll believe you. Just yeah, <laughs> I think, it, yeah. And so, and now she just won two gold medals. Mm. So the same people that we've grown up playing against and with are now competing at the the, the tail the, the nitty gritty end of these international events. So that's pretty exciting for us and um, and for the sport. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Eh? That's um, a sign that things are working. I think uh, so. Just quickly before we get onto the common games, because I do want to talk about that. Um, we've talked about early successes, and uh, we'll talk about highlights when we get to the common games. But uh, but obviously, you've had a successful domestic career um, as well. But what about idols? Are there people that you look up to or have looked up to um, during your career and and tried to model your game off, or thought that's someone I want to want to be like? I think that's a really hard question mm. <laughs> because. I am someone that really embraces being inspired and I think that I've always been someone that's looked up to other people and that's in every aspect of my life. So I look to my friends and family, um, I, I look to other bowlers, other other sports uh, men and sports women and so I think I'm, I'm someone that's always going to look around and be inspired and motivated by attributes and successes of other, other people. So... I actually couldn't pinpoint one person or um, a group of people, but there are multiple people that have influenced, I guess, how I act or um, or how I am in, in all aspects of my life. Fair enough. That's a good answer to that question. I'm always aware it's sort of a it's a hard one to ask, and sometimes you get people who can tell you straight away. You know, here's three people who I've been inspired by. And other times, yeah, it's more like um, yeah, and it's always sort of changing. I guess yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, depending on where you are at in your life. Um, yeah. But no, I feel very luckily lucky and fortunate. There's there's been amazing people in my life and people to look up to and in, in bowls and outside of bowls, which is cool. Very much so. Okay, well, we'll get to the bit that people have probably been waiting to listen about. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not meant to be wearing coughing. Um, so the Commonwealth Games <laughs> that you've just returned from, uh, how did it go? You know, we'll start off there. How did you go? What was the what were the results to that that you were were able to achieve there? So I was playing in the triples and the fours. Um, I was third in the fours and second in the triples, and we came away with two bronze medals in those disciplines. We also ended up with a bronze in the pairs with Caitlin and Selena. So overall, all of us women came home with at least one medal around our necks. So that was really exciting for us. And 
um, for all of us to have put in the time together and go in as a unit and come out with every one of us standing together, mm. having reaped some rewards from all the hard work is pretty special. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, uh, <coughs> I suppose it's a question people want to know. So the build-up to the Commonwealth Games, or when did you fly? So you started on X date. How many days did you get um, over there before before you were uh, into the nitty-gritty bit? Oh, gosh. I think it might have been about 10 days before we actually started competing. Um because we we flew over and then we had a day to adjust to the the time difference. Mm-hmm. We were all quite jet lagged. Yeah. So I think it was about ten days before we actually the game started. We had a build up where we went over, we had a day off to adjust to, to the timing and then we had a couple of training days at a local club and they were very welcoming for us and, and made it like a little home away from home for us, which was brilliant for our training. And we had the whole green to ourselves and were able to get some really good hours in. And then you have to allow a day to get accreditation and, and move into the village yeah. and get extra rat tests and everything like that. So that takes up a whole day. And then there's a bunch of days where we have set times where we can train at the actual venue. So by that point, we were pretty excited to, to finally get to Leamington Spa and see what the greens were like and the atmosphere and the whole setup in general. It's quite important for your mental preparation as well to really get on those those greens and start to uh, prepare your mind for what you're about to do in competition. Absolutely. And uh, I suppose before we talk about the greens, what was it like to, to be into the Commonwealth Games Village, you know, what's that experience like um, as as a bowler? You know, our Trans Tasmans and Will Bowls, it's just bowlers, isn't it? But a Commonwealth Games Village must must feel like a slightly different experience. It's so different, and it's so special, and it seems like every Commonwealth Games is so different as well. Mm. This one in particular was quite different from previous Commonwealth Games villages because they had the three separate villages, so um, we didn't have every sport with us. We had different sports like the sevens, the weightlifting, judo, the cyclists came in later. So we we had a, a bunch of sports and there were two other villages with the rest of the team. So um, it was it was amazing. They we had a great um, setup where we had our own rooms and our own en suites. We had common rooms where we could easily have meetings as a team. That's really important because it's not always easy to find space in a village to have your team meetings, so that was great. We also had a wonderful setup from the New Zealand team where they have a tent uh, so that you can go down and sort of socialise with the support staff and other athletes of the New Zealand team and you can access BBC and Sky Sport where they televise different New Zealand athletes competing. So when you've got a bit of downtime, yeah, you can go and support the other sports by... Not necessarily leaving the village, but having access to watching them, and the the village is like living in a bubble. You know, it's a it's a place where you're surrounded by like minded athletes and people that have made similar lifestyle choices and and put in all this hard work to be competing. And it's really inspiring to be surrounded by so many athletes from different countries and from from New Zealand as well. And yeah, it's it's surreal. You go in and out of security all the time, and you get used to wearing your lanyard and having access to different parts. And yeah, it's strange. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. It sounds interesting, but probably good just once every four years. Out, you don't want to. <laughs> a lot to go through. Um, okay, that's cool. I just it was just a curiosity. So if we talk about the greens now. What was it, what were the what was the bowling facilities like um, like at the Com Games? It was better than we expected. Uh-huh. We prepared for the worst. You know, we were on croquet greens expecting that the greens would be very tough yeah. um, in terms of a uh, bit tracky, you know, different speeds. And if it rained, you know, we were expecting very, very slow. And then if it was sunny and hot, we were expecting it to be a little bit quicker. So we were really prepared for the worst. And we were pleasantly surprised with the quality of the greens at Leamington Spa. Um, they were still tough, I mean, and not perfect. There was one TV rink where we could only play one hand, and so yes, it yeah, might have a few of us looked a bit that. strange with our shot calling, um, but we had to really read the green. So there's, there were definitely challenges, but we were 
we were very excited by the quality of the greens and we were very lucky because they were running at about 11, 12 seconds most of the time. Okay. Um, so for, and yeah, running pretty well. Yeah, for Joe Bloggs who might have watched the Trans-Tasman at um, Mount Tambourine, mm-hmm. what, what did you feel like the difference was between the greens that you played on there and the ones at, at Leamington Spa? Mount Tambourine was slower. That was incredibly slow, especially that, uh, the, the top green that we were playing on, that was that was very, very slow. So I think having that that green being so difficult really pushed us to work even harder at home in mm. between the Trans-Tasman and the Commonwealth Games. And I think it's a big reason why we succeeded over in the UK because it was a huge wake-up call of just how much work we needed to put in even more than what we already had. And so... Um, we went over to the UK expecting tough conditions and having to adapt really quickly. And so we had trained for that. And the greens were quicker over in the UK. um, And it almost got to the point where it felt natural to us, even though it was still incredibly slow slow. compared to our (laughs) greens. Absolutely. Oh, that's good. um, So essentially what happened was what we hoped would happen uh, with the preparation leading up to it. That's... um, that's always good news. So, okay, we'll talk about the medals now. Uh, which one shall we start with? What was the first medal you won? We won the fours first. The fours, cool. Can you talk us mm-hmm. through um, talk us through that event from the section play right through to through to post section? How you guys sort of um, gelled as a team and, and what it felt like along the way? Right. Well, we had a few lead up games, which was good um, against some of the countries. So, we had definitely we went in feeling quite prepared and, and knowing sort of our roles within the team and and what we needed to do to get ourselves stuck out of a rut and that kind of thing. So that was really cool. I think we went in as a strong unit and we hit each other's back. We trusted each other and I think that's a huge part of um, succeeding in an international Mm. stage is is having that strong team bond. So we went in with that and we had a tough first game. We played Wales first in section play and they're a really strong side. And so we went in sort of all guns blazing there and we settled in quite quickly and um, yeah, it was it was a good performance to start us off and that kind of set the tone for the rest of the section play Yeah, and it was nice winning our first two games knowing that that third game against South Africa, it was just a battle of who was going to top the section rather than um, trying this. to qualify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, um, and that was cool playing another a high pressure, high quality game in a lead up to the post section. And then from then on, um, yeah, we we won our quarter final um, against Botswana, which was great because they were tracking along really well and having some really big upsets and, and playing a very almost a quite a, an aggressive game. They yeah. a lot of attacking and a lot of dragging the jacks and that kind of thing. It's almost so, more um, stressful when you're playing those countries that aren't you know, like a uh, yeah, I, I I get what you're saying. Very unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. Very, it's, it's not very a conventional game style. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't expect what they're gonna do. So yeah. we, we rode that one out and that was awesome and and then to lose that semi final was tough. Mm. Um but to come back after that disappointment to then bring home the, the bronze in that in that playoff was really special. And there's something really special about a bronze medal playoff because you have to win to get a medal. And if you lose, you come home empty-handed. So it's, there's quite a lot on the line with a, a bronze medal match. So we're really proud of how we played and how we got the strength to bounce back and, and bring home the medal. Mm. Um, but yeah, we just felt really comfortable as a group and we all backed each other in our skills and our ability and uh, it was amazing to be part of. Yeah, I think we could see, I mean, we got a bit of coverage in New Zealand. Um, to be well, to be fair, we got the best coverage we could have got because there was only two televised ranks. So we got to watch a bit of the bowls, which was cool. Yeah. And I think you could see... Uh, or well, certainly I, I noticed that watching you guys play, um, how close you all were. I thought it was pretty, uh, yeah, like you say, pretty special and pretty, I think it shows a, a lot of mental strength for you guys in that bronze medal playoff to play as well mm-hmm. as you did um, after what, you know, it was a disappointing loss, obviously, to, to India. 
Um, I thought it was pretty cool that you guys sort of got up and you could see how much it meant as well. And you're playing for your country um, too, and I know that there were lots of people shouting at the televisions in support. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it was um, it was cool to see, and uh, thanks for sharing that. I suppose quickly, um, can we just have a chat about the other the other bronze you picked up as well? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the triples then obviously followed on, and it's quite strange going from finishing one event to then going back to square one of another event. Mm. You've got to really enjoy the moment of the first event and then refocus for the next one. And we had this really strong sense that our job just wasn't done yet. And I think we, oh, having experienced that bronze in the fours, it was such an incredible feeling mm. that that triggered us to really want another one. It was addictive. <laughs> it was uh, we we were very hungry after experiencing it once. We're like, okay, we wanna we wanna do that again. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Let's work really hard and see if we can put ourselves in that position again. So it was quite incredible to try and back up that first bronze and try and get another medal. Obviously we were hoping for hoping to go further. Um, and same with the fours, but you still feel incredibly proud with a bronze so we just we got our heads down and we just worked hard again to try and put ourselves in that position of getting another medal so it was really incredible to get through uh we had some really tough post-section games we um well we had a tough section play against England who were the overall winners and Mm -hmm. that was a really great game we were really proud of that game and then we worked hard to knock out Australia in the quarterfinal yeah, um, so can we just quickly talk about that um, that game because yeah. it wasn't televised. Um, mm-hmm. What was you know how how did it go? Talk us through that game against uh, against Australia because as a New Zealander, uh, I think we're all pretty pleased <laughs> <laughs> with with that one. So what what happened there? Oh, uh, it was a battle as you would expect. Um, we respect them as bowlers and as and they're incredible players. So mm. we knew we would have to play really well to beat them, especially after playing them for nine games at Trans-Tasman and pretty much, you know, only winning two games. You know, yeah. we, we know how tough they are. And we know the preparation that they've put in. So we have a lot of respect for how well they can play. And so we just had to had to go for it. And we worked really hard to, to get on top of that game. It was close pretty much the whole way through. Yeah. Um, it was a bit up and down between who was up and who was down. And then we sort of put the foot on the pedal and, and really worked hard to just close the game out. And we ended up, I think, getting a four towards the end, um, if my memory is correct. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was just one of those games where we wanted to prove something to ourselves. And, and yeah, um, I'm not, not too sure even what more to say. It was just a great quality game. And, and it was high quality international bowls. And, yeah. And that's the yeah, thing about to get yeah, it. your international, uh, the international level, isn't it? It's any you know anyone is capable of beating anyone, um, which is what mm-hmm. makes it so interesting and hard to to predict. But um, I was pleased to see that result come through. It was at some crazy hour in the morning for New Zealand, and one yeah. of the um, the the Commonwealth Games actually they did a good job. They had end by end updates on you guys. Yeah, on the thing, the live scoreboard, and yeah. it was great because we could keep track of the other teams when we were back at the village because everyone gets a bit disjointed. At the Com Games, um, you know, there's different disciplines playing at different times. So yeah. it was exciting for us as well to be able to access what's happening end by end. That no, was good. I'm sure I'm not alone, but like at two or three o'clock in the morning, I just sort of go, oh, I've woken up. I'll just have a quick look. Yeah. <laughs> see, <laughs> see how we're going. <laughs> oh, cool. Very good. That's cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, I suppose we'll just finish off that, that story. Um, what's it like, or what was the feelings that, that yeah, you went through when you got that second that second bronze medal with that team? I think the first one was particularly special. Mm. Um, and the second one, the second one felt like a milestone, I think, once we got through to that semi-final. Yeah. Um, it was pretty tough. Malaysia were a tough a tough team to get through and then again we picked ourselves back up to make the most of the opportunity of trying to get a bronze so we were really proud again of how we were able to refocus and work hard to, to come away with the bronze yeah. because of course you're disappointed that that's not the game you want to be playing you want to be in the final so that was really cool and, and to keep it steady and stick to 
how we've been playing for the tournament and try and finish that that last game on a high was yeah. incredible. And to just be in that situation again of putting on the podium gear and walking out there and, and getting a second bronze was just, oh, it, it, it's amazing. And you feel proud of your campaign overall mm. that you were able to be, to play consistently enough that you could come home with two medals. Oh, absolutely, and rightly so. I mean, I don't think, um, I can't overstate it enough if you look at how the New Zealand team went this year in the Northern Hemisphere at a Commonwealth Games. It's in our top four or five campaigns ever since 1930, whenever it started. Um, so, you know, it's uh, certainly, uh, I know a lot of people are pretty proud of um uh, how the New Zealand team went and really pleased uh, for and with with you guys. Um, so thanks for your <laughs> thanks for your efforts wow. and your and your bowls. It's um it's certainly something that we no thank we're, you. We're it means a lot to us as well. You know, it's it's a pretty special feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose the only other question I wanted to ask about the Com Games because when you watch it on television, you have a rank coach sitting there. And I think there was a manager or two. How much mm-hmm. communication did you have with your support staff? during the the game and what sort of communication was it that you had? Um, so for my disciplines and the fours and triples we had Gail Melrose as our rank coach. So she would perch behind the rank and um, she was great support. She often writes down little notes of things that are happening during the game. So um, particularly like what length we might be scoring on so if during the game we need to have a bit of a reassess of a game plan then we can kind of go to her and be like hey look what's working well for us because when you're playing the game you you have a sense of, of where you're scoring and, and why but it's easy to kind of lose track of what lengths you've been playing and what lengths you've been scoring on so things yeah. like that were really helpful or maybe who's if we're holding on the crossover so in our debriefs we can talk about different aspects of the game and how to improve for the next one so she's always there observing the game and and finding patterns I guess you could say Um, but she's also there as just a bit of like moral support so she'll just tear us on if we've played a really good bowl or if we need to have a bit of a mindful moment and talk about something else get out of our heads for a moment we might just talk about something random with her (laughs) and um, lighten the mood or or let off frustration because sometimes there's things that happen during a game where you're personally frustrated with how you might have played during an end or something that might be annoying you and you don't want to burden your team with that because we're all we're all in there trying to battle it out and, and be our best selves and you don't want to bring anyone in your team down. So there might be something that's niggling away at you that you just kind of want to offload but you don't want to put that burden on your team. So she's always there as a bit of a listening ear where you can offload and then let it go, move on and, and keep keep playing. So she's really awesome and she's there to facilitate our debriefs and also um, encourage us at the start. We have we little um, oh, little clips, like climbing clips. I'm not sure. Oh, what are they called? Um, I know the word, but it's lost with my COVID brain. Um <laughs> And so we'd sort of do that before every game and, and, and click our clips together and, and we've got each other, we support each other. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, she's awesome. That's cool. That's good. It's yeah, just a quick, you know, I think I know a lot of people have been watching it and wondering, uh, you see that person sitting there um, and wondering what what, uh, what role they play. So it's it's cool to just sort of get an insight um, yeah. into that. They're good for time limit as well. Like there's a few times we might have to put like a team on the clock because there's, um, yeah, time factors. So if there's players that are exceptionally slow or stalling or whatever, you can go to them and they'll they'll go to the umpire and sort that. So oh, they're cool. good for those kinds of things too. That's good. That's good. A good insight. Well, thank you very much um, for chatting, uh, Taylor. I blinked and it's been a while. <laughs> so so yeah. it's been a, a worthwhile conversation. I've got one more question before we let you um, go. And that's probably the most important question we're going to ask today. It's our bonus question. Uh, so yeah. for you, what is in your ideal sandwich? Oh, I love sandwiches. I love food. So this is a really <laughs> tough one again. And I'm, you know, not the most decisive of what my favourite things are, but... I would say that back in high school, my favourite like lunchbox sandwich would be a simple butter and salami sandwich. Can't go wrong. I respect that. 
Cool. That's a yeah. good. That's a good so answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, um, Taylor, for having a chat to us. It's been an enlightening sort of just about half hour uh, conversation, which is great. Um, uh, <clears throat> I wish you the, the, all the best for the rest of your recovery from the uh, from the plague. I hope it goes well. And uh, good luck for the rest of your season. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. No, oh, it was it was brilliant. So, um, yeah, have, have a good one and thank you very much. Sandwiches, Alex? Yes. Mm. Yeah, we've had a few sandwiches. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's your favourite sandwich? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, when I think of like the, the nicest sandwich, it's like you go to the bakery and you buy a loaf of that fresh, you know, freshly baked, still warm white bread. Mm-hmm. You have some ham, mm-hmm. some butter, yep. maybe a little bit of mayonnaise and tomatoes. Yeah. That's the best sandwich for me. Okay. Okay. Delicious. You don't. You're not. You're not going to do like a guilty pleasure sandwich. No. Or, no. Although, just quickly before I ask you what yeah. your favourite sandwich is. It's just triggered a memory for me. I was on tour. We spoke about the North Island team earlier. Yes. I was on tour with the North Island team for Indoor Bowls a number of years ago now in Greymouth. And for supper, I had a ham and kiwi fruit sandwich. Interesting. That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I love a sandwich. Um, <laughs> peanut butter, all good. Vegemite, yeah. that's nice. Always got to be on white bread. Yeah. However, I have a little foible. And it's, I can put leftovers into sandwich. So if we've had a lasagna the night before, yes. I will have a cold lasagna sandwich. That's interesting. 100%. If I've got chocolate chippy biscuits, like, you know, cookie beer biscuits, I can put no, those. No, 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 no. <laughs> Two pieces of white bread, a couple of cookies, I got a cookie sandwich. A cookie sandwich. A cookie sandwich. That's not a real thing. No, it is Even, a real no, thing. No, it's not. It's a sandwich. If That's it exists, it's real. Um, so what you're saying is that your favourite sandwich is literally anything edible in between two pieces of bread. Not just anything, but you know, there are these quick little things. Lunch and sausage, I am oh. a fan of a lunch and sausage sandwich. Okay. Lunch and sausage maybe dates me a little bit, you know, but but there are there are lots of things. I've um, Speaking of sandwiches... My friend posted something in social somewhere, can't remember which one, but her sandwich was chunky peanut butter, yes, lettuce, and mayonnaise. No. That's what I said. No. So not just, it, I put some weird stuff into sandwiches, but well, I draw yeah. the line somewhere. I didn't think I was going to cover from cookie, <laughs> like chocolate chip cookies in between two bits of bread. but that. If you can bake fairy bread, if you can put hundreds and thousands oh, on bread. Yeah, that's delicious. Fairy yeah, well, you great. can put a biscuit in bread. Okay. It's that simple. <laughs> so maybe my weird little foible here, I love that word, could be what we ask next week. Mm. And maybe we can put that out into social. Mm. Tell us your little weird things. We're not going to ask you what you do with a book or what you put on a sandwich or what you do. Just tell us something weird, something, and keep it PC, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> our community will, little, I'm sure we'll be able to figure something out. Here. Is it something that you do before you go bowling? Is it the way that you've always cooked a roast chicken that's odd to people? Is it... Um, oh, maybe you hang out your socks in pairs because it's easier to take them and put them into, you don't ever have to worry about finding the missing sock between okay. the laundry. Let's do that one next I week. So. Tell us your little little interesting fact. It's a or quirk. A quirk or a, a quirk. foible. Okay. Um, I'm and sold. we'll have a little bit of a chat about that next good. week. What a, it's what been a great a, episode. Yeah, hasn't it just? It's been very good. I'm very excited about next week's one. And I'm sure you all will be too. So if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, remember to share it around. We can be found on Facebook every week from 7pm, as well as Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, and the Bowls New Zealand website, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in next week for more talk about everything Bowls. Until then, roll on. Um, they were rampaged along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or from bottom with six points and second from bottom with five. Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and won six points.
depends what the teams are budget with, doesn't it? The Bowls Hour, brought to you by Somerset Retirement Villages and Dynasty Apparel.